name is Anish Kumar. I'm the Vice President of Enterprise Product Solutions at Cigna. If I couldn't go back to lovely Hartford, Connecticut, <laughs> Uh, I'll probably go to Grand Cayman. Uh, we were there recently uh, last month to celebrate my birthday and my kids' spring break, a fantastic place. Uh, and it definitely worth going twice in a year. <laughs> nice. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Morrow. I'm with Gateway Health out of um, beautiful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And while I can't imagine not wanting to go back to Pittsburgh, <laughs> um, if pressed, I would probably go back to Prague. Um, went there multiple times in the last several years, and it's definitely, I think, my favorite world city other than Pittsburgh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Preston Renshaw, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Refer of Air Health Plans. Um, I think I would follow David down to Costa Rica because, hey, I don't know where I'm going, <laughs> but I think I have a good host, so I think that's where I'd like to go. <laughs> I like this. I see Prague is very nice, mm -hmm. so, yes. Um, well, thank you so much for all being here. And I know we're not going to get to a lot of questions, so notice their Twitter handles. Uh, feel free to ask some questions on there. Sorry, I'm putting you all on the spot now. <laughs> um, but let's, I mean, before we get into this whole consumer-centric, it's so important that we understand what the definition is. So I just want to go down the line, and there's no right or wrong answer. If you can just tell me a simple definition, what is it to you? Not Nobody go on their phones and look it up. What does it mean <laughs> to you? So I, I believe that um, healthcare begins and ends with the consumer, mm -hmm. no matter how you look at it. I think it, it's how to look at your uh, member or consumer holistically, not just from the standpoint of what they're dealing with in their physical health, but you know what they're dealing with, you know, as far as their personal life, because that all leads into the, the physical health. Uh, I think from a standpoint, if you look at behavioral health, uh, I've been told that 50% of physical health is driven by behavioral health. So if you look at the person as a whole, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's really how you have to look at, at the whole situation. Okay. Uh, when I think of the term, uh, I think of it in two, two aspects. The first is, does the consumer have the right tools to make the appropriate purchase decisions? Uh, these are the purchase decisions for healthcare financing or healthcare itself. Once they have purchased uh, their services, do they have the right information and, and decision rights to get the best use out of the healthcare system? Uh, and today, both of these are opportunities. Neither of them is true today. But once we get to those, then I, I would think of our industry as being consumer-centric. So I t have a very... Um different take on this coming from a plan that is predominantly a Medicaid plan. Um, we are, I like to think at least, the original consumer-centric healthcare kind of group because we are constantly trying to pull our consumers into utilizing our services. Um, as most of, I think everyone in this room would be aware, um, we only have so many levers that we can use to maximize our profitability and our effectiveness, and, and probably the most difficult one that we have to try and influence is the behavior of our members. Um, they're oftentimes difficult to find, difficult to reach, and their behaviors um, can be driven by, as you mentioned, a lot of factors outside of our control and sometimes outside of our knowledge. So we are working at this from a slightly different tack, which is to attempt to predict their behaviors, um, get in front of their behaviors so we can drive their behaviors toward helping us help them. I think from the provider perspective, um, having been a physician you know, for my entire career, I find it interesting um, as I talk with providers, hospitals about patient care, uh, customer service, what that means, age caps, I think it's and we still do this today, you will go back to your office and Michelle will be the 25-year-old <laughs> diabetic. <laughs> Mary will be the 20-year-old <laughs> <laughs> <Funny. laughs> hypertensive. Mm -hmm. But when we reframe that and we say it's Preston, who's a 43-year-old husband, father of four, who's dealing with depression 
and an inability to manage your diabetes. That's a very different picture. And until we as a provider community, again, I'm thinking, talking from provider level, until we think of individuals in that manner, you are always a disease. And as me, as a, as a patient, now that as a consumer, do, I do not want to be considered a patient. A patient is ill. They are suffering. I would argue that the providers who are caring for them are suffering just as much. So who is really the patient in the room? Because we know that from nurses and physicians, the, the, the amount of fatigue and burnout that's going on within your industry, we're either alcoholics, we're either drug abusing, <laughs> because, or we're committing suicide. I mean, you look at the statistics. So who is really suffering? So I think until we look at each other differently, we will have a very tough time becoming consumer-centric. Now I'm warming you up for the big pun here. I will give my view as a nurse, it's customer service, but when I start charge, when a patient comes in, I'm taught that that discharge starts from when I first see the patient when they come in. So my customer service starts then. When now as things are changing, social media and everything, it's said that customer service, consumer-centric starts before that customer gets into the hospital and should continue until after the hospital gets into, after the patient gets into the hospital. So personally, I think we're missing it. Where, where are we starting? Where are we ending? And there is something called the consumer centric, but then there's consumer focused. In business, it's better to be, some would say, consumer focused because as I've heard through this the panel discussions I've had is, come on, the bottom line is money. And how do a lot of companies make money? You have to pinpoint your demographic. You're in the insurance world, we all know, it's you wanna get more healthier people into your pool. You can't be perfect with everyone. So think about how we're doing that, if we're doing that. Think about what you're doing right now that's even customer-centric. And I want to see what, now hopefully your bosses aren't here, maybe. I'm going to put you on the spot and say, what are you doing right now to enhance that, whether it's consumer-focused or consumer-centric, based on those two definitions. Remember, consumer focus being that demographic, how are you encouraging them, that patient keeping them, getting them, and as well as consumer-centric. We'll start here. It's two questions, really. Okay. So I guess from a standpoint, I'm like Mary. Um, the, the, the member that we deal with is people that you know you have to reach out to. Um, you know, from from the organization I'm with, you know, we have a very strong mission statement. It's all about the member, which is really some one of the things that I'm very proud of. I think from a standpoint, cost is always a factor. In fact, cost is also a factor for the member because the more the cost are, the, you know, the higher the, the medical costs, the higher the healthcare costs. So you have to consider both, but I think you gotta always put the member first, and I think there's ways of doing that. Um, there's been a lot of discussion this week uh, about telehealth, and we're exploring that very heavily to say, how do we reach out to our members? How do we get to them? Um, one of our biggest challenges is getting to our members at times. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. I'm gonna do a follow-up after we go through the list here. I'm picking my notes. <laughs> uh, let me follow up, Michelle, on your comment about where consumer centricity st starts and stops. Uh, from a payer perspective, definitely from the Cigna perspective, uh, healthcare uh, is an interesting product in that you consume healthcare and you should be engaged with your health throughout your life. So there's really no specific transaction that ends your consumption until you are no longer around. Uh, and, and at Cigna, we call it year, seamless year-long customer experience, meaning that you have a, an enrollment that happens once a year. And many, many customers, when we survey them, say that I did not really know what I was getting into. Uh, I got into this high deductible plan. Uh, I have uh, the doctors I want are not in the product I have, but I was trying to save 50 bucks a month. Nobody told me uh, in simple English what I should have gotten, and that's that's one part of the well, one part of co consumer centricity. The second part, as I mentioned earlier, is now that you have purchased something, is somebody uh, your trusted advisor? 
Uh, and a great example uh, outside of healthcare is uh, USAA. Uh, many of you probably know them. Uh, and a lot of USAA customers are military and ex-military people. Uh, I was at a call center that they own, and one, uh, one military uh, gentleman calls and says, you know, I make whatever, $35,000 a year. I want to buy a Cadillac Escalade. Mm -hmm. Can I get a loan from you? Uh, a traditional approach would have been the bigger loan that I give them, the more money I'll make in interest, uh, interest payment. But this customer service representative walked this gentleman down from this exorbitant purchase. Why? Because they were their advisors, and they saw a much longer term relationship than making money on a specific transaction. And, and that's really where my company is going, which is we have to, we have to stop thinking of specific transactions. Now they, in the aggregate, uh, join, join up to a journey, but unless we start with that journey, we're not going to be able to invest in the right areas. Okay. So, several thoughts. One is, one of the things you said to me resonated. We're, we're very mission focused as well, but our CEO has a line I always love, which is, no margin, no mission. You know, we're, <laughs> so we're, we're always focused on the mission of, of servicing the member, but we're also focused on doing it in a way and getting in front of helping the member in a way that helps sustain that mission by making sure we can stay in business to do that. Our members um, don't choose us in the same way, so that's an interesting place to start a relationship with them. So one of the things that has been interesting for me um, as we are kind of re reviving, revitalizing, um, changing the way that we engage our members and develop their experience is that you know there's a large element of meeting them where they're at and we don't always know where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, it involves in, in this, with our population, a lot of boots on the ground, a lot of home visits, a lot of um, what I think is often thought of as old-fashioned medical care, um, old-fashioned treatment. We're meeting them um, at the place they live, at the place that they worship often. Um, we're trying to find unique ways to reach out to them. And then one of the things, the thoughts that occurred to me when you were talking about where does it start and stop, um, one of the things that we're trying to do a lot with predictive work in particular is that we're trying to protect our members even before they've been born. Um, one of the, the challenges we have with our population is that oftentimes prenatal care um, isn't obtained until sometimes they're in active labor, um, sometimes they're late in their pregnancy, um, and you know I don't need to explain to this group you know the impact of that with uh, you know babies with issues and, and mothers with issues afterwards. So we are trying to use predictive analytics to really hone down, in particular when are we starting to see behaviors that indicate that this member may be pregnant so we can reach out proactively. So it, that your question prompted me to think we're trying to, to begin to work with our members and be focused in them in a lot of cases before they're even born. Yeah. I think for our organization, you know, consumer focus, we've done a lot of work around uh, the telemedicine world. Um, for those who are familiar with uh, Barron Health, we, we live in 10% of the critical access hospitals in the country today. Um, we already, to our members, again, meeting them where they're at, that focus is, you know, there's a lot of folks who do not want to go to the office. They feel more comfortable with them in a clinic. We, we put kiosks in high V's. We put American Amwell uh, physician services in their hands because there's a lot of unique uh, members with very unique experiences that we try to offer all of those opportunities to. I, I do think in healthcare, um, any, any organization that you know, talks about discharge and uh, folks leaving the facility, um, there's no company that wants to lose a member. They want them to continue to come through their doors to be a, uh, a focus of those efforts. So I, for us, it's truly a, uh, a rede redefining 
uh, what that is because we don't, we don't even want to use the discharge within our, our facilities, within our organization, because it's a continual member experience. So when we pick up new members, uh, it is really about what is that focus for them? Uh, because if we don't understand that when they join us, there's no way that we'll be able to meet um, the needs of that individual uh, without understanding where they're coming from first. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. Let's pick up from there. You said understanding where your customer is coming from. Is there a checks and balances of where that customer is coming from? Like. You have some great ideas, going to the patients, meeting the patient at their home, meeting the patient. Um, what about some other patients that maybe don't like that? Is there somebody in your organization, and anybody can jump at this, that when you find, like, is there anybody calling up and saying, hey, how was that, how was that home care? How was that minute clinic? And then when the patient says, oh, it was awful. I went to the minute clinic and nothing was working. Is there anybody checking up on that, and what are they doing? So I'd like to answer that. I, I think one of the, the things that we're trying to do is not trying to do it to them, or we're trying to do it with them. Does right. that make sense? And really get involved in their lives to some degree. Um, you know, we're expanding into something called life services, which is really around helping people. What's your education? You know, um, do you have a job? How can we help you get a job? So it's going to that degree because all of that affects your health. Right. So um, it's really being part of their lives, and, and that's when you really, I think, get to where you need to go. Any other comments on this? Just to riff off of what you said, um, we have a very large C-SNP and D-SNP population, um, chronically ill, and, and um, we are moving into the LTSS world with Pennsylvania just now having an RFP out for that, very similar kind of dynamic. I mean, the, the state is actually requiring that um, you know, the, the MCO help provide support with job services, um, finding homes, and, and so that is a, a really all-encompassing involvement. But to your point, I think um, I will say for us that we do some of that checking. I don't think we ever do as thorough a job as we want. And I, I was telling someone a story since I've been down here that it really is. I have some poor health coach from our health insurer who's probably called me every week since the beginning of the year, and I haven't called the woman back once. I'm sure I'm on a blacklist someplace at the health <laughs> insurer. But, you know, the last thing I want to do is take time to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. What we found, and, and it's in the aggregate, though, is most of our members are responsive to that, and I think it is probably a function of that particular population and demographic, but um, we probably do need to do a better job of validating that. We do call uh, our, our email our customers, but we don't call them members. Uh, this was my boss's boss's a decision a few years back. We moved away from members and patients. So we call our customers mm -hmm. uh, as long as we have their phone number or email after every visit, and a reasonable number of them respond. However, what is starting to happen at least on the commercial side, is more and more customers want uh, digital tools for self-service and for making the right decisions. So they, they want to uh, speak with us, us as much as they want to speak with Amazon, which is not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when you go to Amazon, you feel and you believe that you have the right decision tools, whether you're buying a coffee maker or a 65-inch television set, you read reviews, you can return things if you don't like them. Uh, there is an expectation of when your product will arrive. Those are the types of things that we are investing in. Of course, we are far from being good at it, and, and I believe the whole industry has its work cut out for us. But more and more customers are saying, tell me about this doctor, tell me about this facility, tell me about this minute clinic. Another interesting a uh, need that has emerged, uh, at least in a small sub, uh, subset of our customers, and I believe it will become everybody, is access to clinical notes. Hmm. So customers are uh, frustrated that they cannot see what their doctors and physical therapists write about them. Uh, more and more are on Google, and they read things such as 15, 20, 30 percent of soap notes have material mistakes in them. So what they're feeling probably validly is that the, such a mistake exists in their notes. And even if it doesn't, they should at least know what's being written. So they don't feel like customers at all. They feel like uh, they've been infantilized 
people who are not smart enough to read uh, read about the work that was done for them when it's when it's their money. Now there are some special cases, especially in behavioral health, mm -hmm. when uh, that is not appropriate for uh, customers who have suicidal tendencies and, and so forth. But that's 0.01 percent of the population. Most of us would want that. Uh, payers have, of course, not done a good job at all. Uh, the very few initiatives in the U.S. today are around the Open Notes project, uh, mostly a provider-driven initiative. So that's something that's, uh, that I'm passionate about. I believe that customers should have access to their clinical notes. They should control their health information. And if they leave Cigna, the information should go with them to Aetna or wherever they go. Uh, so I, I think those are the types of things that will make the industry consumer-centric, uh, and it is not today. Uh, let me follow up on that, because I've been on the side where the patient will get the notes and won't know what to do with the notes once they get it. And they'll, patients love complaining, and unfortunately, social media, once it's out there, it's out there, and your customer service will go down. How do you control that? How do you control, like, what, is there anything you can do to alleviate that bad customer experience where it goes out there on public and help that patient decide what to do with their notes? Because doctors, I know, they don't have time. They don't want to deal with it. So who does? What, are there any solutions up here? You know, one of the things that we started within our organization about two years ago is, is and Michelle can speak to this, but it's, it's an advocate. Um, we have those advocates who members can call. We try to get out front again. After you've had that visit, do you really understand what your next steps are? I mean, there's a note, but I don't understand what's in the note. It doesn't make sense to me. So someone who's literally helping them through that. I mean, it's a little bit different when you work in an integrated delivery system because they kind of see everything. Um, I can see it from start to finish, so our advocates are there uh, front and center for those individuals to help see that information and communicate that information because Again, if you can't, then there's a huge disconnect already, and then there's a trust issue. Um, I find it interesting that uh, in the health consumer world, that only around 58% of the consumers trust their physician. 60% of consumers trust their health insurance. So from the provider perspective, I find it interesting now that consumers are now trusting their carriers higher than their providers. I don't think the physician community knows that. I don't think they understand that. Uh, again, because that's part of the disconnect. Who pays the bill? Well, it's the insurer. So there, there's, there's a shift, there's a paradigm that's, that's occurring. So again, anything we can do from an advocacy standpoint to help uh, supply that information is pivotal uh, to success. Yeah. Since that's a good solution. I've, I've heard a lot of, especially insurance companies are hiring nurses to kind of triage the patient. But when do you engage? to stop that bad customer service? When have you, is there a solution when you engage the advocate? Um, uh, it, it, in my mind, advocacy is, is not about responding to uh, a bad social media right. post. Uh, so, so these are two different things. We, we use an ad advocacy service and uh, really their role is one of the first things I said, which is for to have the consumer get the most out of the system. So if it is December 25th and you haven't had your eyes tested in two years, and on December 31st, that benefit will expire, I would rather have that expense be incurred because if your eyes are not, if your eyesight is not working properly, you're likely to have other problems. And if we can proactively reach out to them, either through text or an advocate based on their preferences, that's a great thing. The other thing is they go on Facebook or they go on some social me medium and and write something bad about Cigna, Aetna, and so forth. This happens all the time. We have a, a dedicated team at Cigna that monitors mm -hmm. social media sentiment and posts 24 by 7 by 365. It's, it's a war room type of construct. Their response is much, much faster than if you call Cigna. <laughs> uh, for the obvious reason that millions of people are potentially seeing what we post, what I encourage my customers to do is to, in fact, go to Facebook and not call Cigna. If you have a bad experience, post it on Facebook. That is your empowerment. So I'm all for an empowered customer, and let us take the heat, and let us respond to them. Because of HIPAA, we cannot respond to them with their PHI, obviously. So we have to say, please call me or email me at, 
at this address, and I can address your concern. But the consumer has been backed into a corner with really no power. This is the only sector of the economy where that happens, and that's a bad thing. That's what all of us are trying to fix. And part of the change that a behemoth like my employer will make is when something like this uh, is happening. And one other data point from a different company is when I worked at Aetna, uh, Mr. Bertolini, the CEO, he has a Twitter handle and he directly communicates with customers, which is mind boggling. So he will directly speak in public about their cancer treatment. <laughs> it's just mind boggling. And I, I, I draw my inspiration from that particular interaction. So consumers should absolutely go to social media, write their good and bad experiences, Calling uh, a company like Aetna, Signa, Humana is a private conversation. You don't really have the power of the crowd with you. On the social media, you do. Slightly different um, take on that, and certainly not with the same scale, and, and that is a very brave CEO. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. But our CEO has something similar instituted where um, she has a hotline. So one of the responsibilities I have is the service center and every one of the, the CSRs is empowered to know that if uh, they have a caller and the caller you know, goes through, um, they aren't happy with the resolution of the issue or, or it's not an issue we can resolve necessarily as, yep. as much as we'd like to have control over all of it. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, they're able to you know, ask for the CEO and we have a hotline they switch to. Now, she does not answer it directly, um, but she does get each one of those calls eventually. They are called, um, and what's interesting about it is we don't publicize it. You know, it's not, well, would you like to speak to our CEO? Certainly, but um, when someone asks to speak to a supervisor, a manager, to me, to whomever, they speak to that person. You know, we, we reach that person then. It is still a private conversation. Um, but we, we try to do that. Our members are empowered in so few places in their lives that um, one of our directives and, and really one of our philosophies within the service center is that we may be the only people who show that member the respect that they're due as a human being in the course of that day. They don't lead easy lives. And as we take our folks through training, we tell them that if you're making, um, if you're making a call, even if it's the wrong call, at the end of the day, if it was made with the goal of doing the right thing for the member, there'll never be a negative fallout from that. That's true. So. Uh, just a, po folks can raise their hands if they want. How many of you in your organization sit in your customer call center? And so I don't think unless, for again, for Avera, that's, that's one of the things that we have to do. CEO, CFO, we, we sit in the customer call center. Why? Because if we don't understand what's truly going on with our mm -hmm. consumers, uh, we don't have a clue. And the answer is, most times, we don't have a clue. <laughs> so uh, again, if, if, if we're not sitting on the front line and understanding that and having those conversations with folks, there's really no way uh, for us to improve the uh, overall experience for our yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have to second that because when I wrote my first book, Healthcare for Less, I actually interviewed Tom Scully mm -hmm. um, with CMS. You all might be familiar with him. And I remember in the conversation, taped recording, he said that what he did on a daily basis is call up CMS, call up himself. <laughs> and he said 60% of the time he got the wrong answer. Yeah. That's, there's a problem there. It is, yeah. And we, you all out here are part of organizations. The only way that we can help or even educate our, our members is to educate ourselves on what's happening on mm -hmm. that end. So I encourage you all to do that. Sit in your call center at least, at least once a week because there's always something new going on, which goes to my other, I think these are great ideas that you're bringing up, is how do you educate the customer on what you're doing? These are great ideas. How, how do I, or how do I, with the people I'm telling when they come to me and they say, Michelle, what's the best insurance? 
And I'm like, I can't make that decision for you, but I can tell you what these companies are doing. Um, and maybe the person I'm talking to is, I want, I want to feel like someone's listening. That's all people want when they're sick. You can, you can really take away from that negative press just by a phone call, just by somebody calling up and listening. They start out yelling, but mm -hmm. then once you listen and that person's like, you know what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. How you educate people on where to go, let them know they're not going to talk to the CEO, but the CEO will hear. Is there any solution to that? Is there any outreach? So I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to answer this. I think um, we put a lot of emphasis on understanding the consumer or the member. Uh, we have member simulations, so understanding what their life is like. I've gone through it. It's great. Um, we also do where you can, you know, you, we actually call our CSRs customer advocates. So we don't even, that, that's their job is to be advocates. I, I like to say I've, I've done that simulation. I've gotten nervous three times in my role. Once when I interviewed with the first one, one was the CEO, and there time I had to go on the phone and talk to a member. It is hmm. very, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting thing. And I think getting that perspective of what the consumer or member is dealing with, that's the first step. Right. Yeah. And uh, I would like to take it in, in a different way, which is uh, the industry has to get the basic stuff right. And this theme has come up a couple of times in, in this conference. And until we get the basic activities right, uh, our education is not effective. And then after we can educate them, then we can uh, earn the right to become their advisors. But we are not there. I mean, I know that my company is not there, where we can advise them on how to stay healthy. So the basic stuff that we have to get right is you know, claim payment, their ID card, that the provider directory, th those types of uh, things uh, uh, are, are already broken. So once we fix them, then the education component comes in. One, one major aspect of uh, commercial uh, uh, managed care that most consumers are not aware of is that most large employers pay for these benefits themselves. So a company like Cigna, Aetna, Humana, and so forth is really providing administrative services. Well, so when they call us or when they write on Facebook that this big bad insurance company is not paying for my, my experimental therapy, it's really the, um, their employer who has said, we will not pay for this. Now we, pro we advise them in terms of medical policy, but it's their choice, whether it is infertility drugs, whether it is high-end radiation, uh, oncology and so forth, and it is our fault that we have not been able to describe such a basic and fundamental part of managed care to our customers. If they did understand that, their perspective would be different. They would say, okay, I work at a company that doesn't provide for this, right? So I, I think these are the types of basic things where we can educate them. And again, here the medium is changing, and, and obviously our customer base is a little bit different from yours perhaps, uh, uh, the way I, I was thinking when Mary was speaking was most of our customers, in fact, have a reasonably good life. Uh, they are productive, well-adjusted, generally healthy members of society, and the worst part of their life is dealing with us. <laughs> so the best part of their life may be dealing with you, but the worst part by far is dealing with us. So we have our work cut out for us in a different way because they look at us and they compare the Amazon experience and the banking experience and uh, Netflix experience to the Sigma experience, and we have to somehow match up against those experiences. <laughs> I, I want to kind of switch this around a little bit because most of us are providers up here. Um, we're talking about the patient. Now let's move it to how do you keep your providers happy? The doctors, you hmm. on the other hand, is there is there a customer service solution to that? How do you keep that doctor in your network that wants to still use your company? Because you know, whatever the doctor feels, it goes straight yeah. on to the patient. And in fact, when I consult with some of the patients, I, I tell them, I say, you know, ask your doctor, what plan is he happy with? When there's an appeals process, are they on the phone? And if your doctor's happy, they'll go to bat for you when there's a claim denial. So how do we keep our providers happy? I have a little bit different perspective because I am part of an integrated delivery system. So really when it, it, it is, has to do with dealing with physicians, most of what we do from an uh, uh, insurance perspective is really designed and driven by our providers. Our providers are part of our policies. Our providers are part of our 
developing our networks, our providers are part of, well, where, where are inadequacies and where do we need to do better? So we brought those folks to the, to the table because if those folks aren't at the table, they will be your worst enemy. Um, so without them, you know, my, my uh, existence is, is, is pretty futile because then I can have a Cigna, I can have a Humana, I can have anybody come in and pay the claim. Uh, so really getting providers to believe in being the pay vider or the, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's who we, we, we've uh, decided to become is, is we have, if we're going to provide all those services, the providers have to be intimate in that relationship. So that is changing comps, uh, which is never easy from the provider world. All of those, if you've been dealing with uh, provider compensation contracts with your providers, not just the health system, but inside the walls of these facilities, uh, they are very big battles. But again, that, that conversation is different when you're helping design the policy. So I think any uh, payer in the market has to have those folks at the table uh, or it be, will be very difficult uh, to line your strategy. Yes. Uh, I, would, I would add that the pay wider or the integrated vision that you described, Preston, is really what uh, all of us aspire to. So, so the model we have today with the managed care people on this side and the providers on that side and everybody working with everybody, it's not working and it's not going to work. Uh, and some version of the pay wider uh, vision is the answer. Until we get to that, because that's, that's a big change for most of us, what do we do? And, and the way I look at it is today the way uh, managed care companies have tried to address in medical inflation is by putting more and more obstacles and bureaucracy and hoops for doctors and clinics. Uh, it's really a, a very a Soviet style <laughs> way of managing medical cost where you have to do this and get this off number and put that into the EMR and, and so forth. And that's why providers, uh, for good reason, hate managed care companies. So that's, that's not working. And also, if you've been on the provider side, I used to own a clinic uh, many years ago, most of them can game the system. Most mm -hmm. of them can, because they control the whole delivery of the service, they can add a different site of care, they can change the ICD-9, and I mean, who's going to look at you know, wh what it was and what it should have been and so forth. So it's a totally worthless exercise. The right uh, direction is to align interests, is, is to say, you know what, right. you have some skin in the game, we have some skin in the game, we, the managed care company, are providing you services to help you succeed. But you have skin in the game. So you are not writing scripts and then with no regard to cost, the whole thing happens. And that, that era is gone and it's not going to come back. Of course, providers will resist that too because it makes them think differently about scarcity and trade-off. It changes their relationship with their patients because now money comes into the picture when they are trying to say you can get a stent or you can take aspirin or you can go to physical therapy. Earlier, they would say, hey, the gold standard is get a stent. So those types of tough conversations, I believe providers can deal with. These are some of the smartest people in our society. They have extensive training. Most of them got into this field to make the world a better place. So I'm very hopeful that this risk sharing, uh, helping the provider system is a better model than the bureaucratic system. I think the, I'm sorry, the, uh, Two things with our providers, you know, they're not getting a high reimbursement rate, yeah. right? So I think two things that you said that really resonate with me that, that we're working very hard to do. One is aligning interests. And I think that um, like most things in, in an economic society, at the end of the day, that's what will drive yeah. long-term changes in behavior. The other thing, though, that I think is, is very key, especially with our providers, is you have to have your basic blocking and tackling down. They're not getting paid an enormous amount to work with our patients. Our patients tend to be complex and difficult patients to work with sometimes. You can't throw any blockages up in their path or they're going to run screaming from the door, right? Right. Or what I've seen is you talked about gaming the system. A gastroenterologist will come in and they'll say instead of doing a colonoscopy, I'll do an EUS. I get reimbursed more. So how do you get the doctor, the provider, to perform the best care. Thus, it's all ricochets. Mm. So they get the best care, 
Um, this way, they're not gaming the system, but they're still giving the patient the best care, and the, the patient's happy that they're getting the best care, and people are getting reimbursed the way. How do you, where do you start? Where do you go? So I think it, it comes down, again, to the partnership. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm going to say, be the first one to speak up, that we do not have a good partnership <laughs> with the providers today. We're working very hard on that. Uh, we're talking about a lot of value-based reimbursement, those kind of things. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. In fact, I think we put so much focus on our members, uh, we have kind of ignored our providers, and right. it's catching up with us, quite frankly. Thus the smaller, narrowing networks. Yeah. And I yeah. think, so would, would you agree almost that we almost need to re adjust our focus to be more provide, keeping our providers happy or keeping our customers happy? It's a balance. you got to do both. Really do. Yeah, and, and I, I don't even believe that they are in conflict. Uh, right. Yeah, there's, a, there's some investment right. trade-offs to be made. I mean, that's true at, at every company. Do you spend $20 million on your website or $10 million on getting the provider directly right? I mean, those sorts of trade-offs exist. But if the marketplace becomes more functional, then everybody is happy and everybody can operate uh, much more efficiently. And, and one thing, one data point that gives me hope uh, is that there are provider systems uh, such as Iora Health, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the hospital systems that have started going to employers directly. And they are saying, you know what, for this service line, uh, let me take service line capitation. I'm going to manage the doctor versus the coach versus the physical therapist. And I don't want to deal with uh, contracted rates and so forth. And then if you do have another managed care company, then but we, this service is carved out of you know, their management. Now, obviously, we don't like that particularly, but we could work with something like that. And the, the reason that is happening is that the model today, which was you know, fee-for-service mode, is working so poorly that the progressive providers are, are going to this mode. So I, I believe there is goodness, there is hope, and we have, to, we have to channel that, again, by becoming the right providers to providers. And there, there are a few interesting facts that I want to bring up. Um, read somewhere that four to five consumers find it difficult to compare the cost and quality during the decision-making process. And three out of four feel that the healthcare decisions are the most expensive, but they're also the most important that they make. With that in mind, we also know that the patient experience falls short of the ROI, and that will follow. So. My end question is, where do we start? Like, where, what is, and I'll go down the list, what's the number one thing that individually you don't have to agree with each other, that, <laughs> that if you were CEO of your company, what's the one thing you would start with? And everybody's going to be different, so we'll start here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess from a standpoint of, of building those partnerships, um, you know, balancing out your focus on both provider and consumer. Um, you know, I, I thought your point was they're not in conflict. You know, they really aren't. So I think that's where I would start. The quickest ROI uh, for my company, if I were to guess, is bringing more transparency into the healthcare experience. Which insurance to buy, which doctor to go to, which therapy is potentially most efficacious for them. Uh, that is something where we have oceans of data, consumers are looking for it, and it doesn't require a long-term change, such as working with providers differently, which is, of course, on the roadmap, but this is something we can and should do today. I think for us, it really is a function of predictive capabilities. Um, taking the, the data, and we're in the same situation. We have oceans of data. It's how do you synthesize it? How do you, you devise meaningful algorithms from it to predict the behavior so that we can intercede and help guide the outcomes at the beginning of the process? For me, it's, it's, it's transparency. It's, it's price transparency. Yeah. Um, because, again, as whether I'm a CEO or I'm the provider in front of that individual trying to make a decision, any provider who says we don't ration care, we ration care. <laughs> <laughs> we ration care every day. And the reason I know that is because when I see you and I know that you're dealing with a difficult situation and I'm going to order that study 
I can take a ballpark guess and say, well, an MRI and ankle is going to cost a few thousand dollars. You can't afford that. I can't do that to you because whatever I'm trying to do to help you get through that situation, I've just added, I've just compounded to that problem by now putting this extra burden on you. You cannot afford it. So until providers are able to have that type of transparency in their hand yep. to help a consumer make that decision, I mean, you want to make a win, Cigna. I mean, this Avera. If I'm a provider, I'm sitting there, and now Nick's in the office, and we're going to do this, and I know he has this insurance, and I'm going to order that MRI, and I know it's going to be $2,000 for him out of pocket. You want to get it today or not? No. We just made a decision. <laughs> now we're making a treatment plan that he can live with. Yep. And if it comes back, he knows, I know I'm going to pay that kind of cash to have that treatment option. But that's a huge win for the consumer out there because with these high deductible plans, they have no idea what kind of costs they're in. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's for me is transparency is number one. Yep. Uh, and I, I think these are all great ideas. As I said, no one's right, no one's wrong. <laughs> and I just hope you all enjoy this. I want to thank my panelists. It, I think it was a great conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope you all have a safe trip back to where you're going. And I hope you all get your vacations to Grand Canyon <laughs> and everywhere else. Thank you. If anyone has any questions.